Well, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to finally be here and to see you all uh, in the flesh. And uh, I do want to say, take this opportunity to, yeah, to, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be pastor here, at the English pastor at the Northcote Baptist Church. And it's a real privilege to be entrusted with this opportunity. I also want to thank Glynis, who's been serving here as a faithful uh, interim capacity over the past 13 months or so. Also want to thank Rosemary for her tireless service to this church and her capable administration. Uh, and also want to thank Flora and the other deacons uh, for being involved in the process. And also to thank Colin for the work he's already done, odd jobs, and writing an excellent and informative history of Northcote Baptist Church, which I found very illuminating. And I also want to thank you all for turning up this morning. Uh, it's great to be here and I am very much grateful, looking forward to the opportunity to serve here at Northcote Baptist Church. Now as I begin this role and to serve you here in the church, I thought in this first Sunday morning that I would share a bit about my own personal journey and about why I've come to believe some of the things that I believe about life, God, Jesus and the Bible. Uh, and I thought by sharing this message I've entitled Why I Am a Christian uh, would allow me to, to, you to get to know me a little bit, to share my personal journey and my convictions uh, a little better. And in the process perhaps appreciate why I believe the Christian message is worth believing and the historical person of Jesus is worth following. So, well, I'll begin at the beginning and I was born at a very young age and I was brought up in a Christian home where I attended church each week. My dad was a Uniting Church minister and I grew up in and around immersed in church life. We lived mainly in rural New South Wales and we lived for three years in Bega on the south coast of New South Wales, six years in Coolamon, which is near Wagga Wagga, which is in the Riverina of New South Wales, where I started school, and then three years in rural England in Shropshire and then my high school years were spent in Taree on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. And there's some of the pictures of some of the churches that I used to attend when I was growing up. Now, whilst I attended church each week, I did so reluctantly. For when I was a teenager, I really didn't like church. I found it a bore and I couldn't wait to get, I couldn't, couldn't wait till it was over and I could go home and do really interesting things like play computer games or watch TV or do just about anything else. Now, I particularly hated 1990 when I was about 15 years old because Christmas Day fell on a Tuesday, which meant that I had to go to church three days in a row. Sunday the 23rd of December, Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day. I felt joy when the church finished on Christmas Day and I could be free to open up my presents and relax and do what I liked. In my teenage years, I couldn't wait until I was 18 and I could be free to make the decision to not to go to church anymore. If I had my own way, I wouldn't go to church and the last thing I ever thought of as a career was working as a church pastor. It seemed to be about the worst job that I could possibly imagine. I wanted to earn lots of money and not have anything to do with church. And yet, here I am, some 30 years later, commencing the job that I despised when I was a teenager. So, what changed? How did I go from being a teenager who, didn't, who couldn't really wait to be old enough not to go to church, to now devoting my life to encouraging people to come to church every week? Well... A lot changed and I don't have time to detail every moment or change in my thinking but whilst I confess that whilst I disliked church I never really had profound doubts about the truth of the Bible or the Christian faith. I participated in church, I sang the songs, I sang, said the liturgy, I never saw the Christian faith as an evil repressive force, I never saw hypocrisy in the lives of my parents or their marriage and I never saw hypocrisy in the Christians around me. I just found it irrelevant to my life and just boring and got in the way of other things that I saw as being more fun and interesting and it definitely didn't animate my life or provide any purpose or meaning to it. But I would also say that I was a pretty unreflective teenager. Socrates says that the unexamined life is not worth living. So according to his metric, my teenage life was fairly worthless because I really didn't examine much of my life at all. I live without much self-reflection or thoughtfulness. If someone had asked me, why do you go to church? I wouldn't have really been able to give an answer apart from, well, my mum and dad make me. 
If someone had asked me what makes life meaningful, I really wouldn't have been able to give a meaningful answer. I just would have wanted to live a fun life and had aspirations of making lots of money. Well, this is now my 46-year-old self who has thankfully done a little bit more reflection and examination and thinking, speaking on why I am a Christian today and why I think it's the most important and most significant decision that a person could make. For there are many, many reasons why I'm now a Christian, and in fact, too many for one message, and perhaps there might be another message at some point with part two about why I'm a Christian. But I thought that I'd share some of the most significant reasons which convinces me that the Christian message is worth believing and that Jesus is worth following, as I share some more of my own story. And the first and most fundamental reason that I'm a Christian is that I believe it's true. And that connected to that, I believe that if something is true, then we should believe it and follow it. Now it's common in our world today for people to claim there is no God. The Christian message is false and the Bible is nothing but ancient fiction. Yet I came to believe that the Bible, and most importantly the New Testament, was a trustworthy account of the world-changing events which transpired 2,000 years ago. Now despite being a pretty unreflective, hedonistic teenager, when I was about 14, some questions about the Christian faith did actually start to emerge. I do remember wondering if Jesus was a real historical figure and if there was any evidence for Jesus outside of the Bible. And then perhaps providentially around that time I watched an excellent video produced by the Bible Society called Messages from the Memory Banks. You can see the, the wonderful 1980s kind of typeset there and, and fonts. I watched it on our brand new VHS player. Now this was the days when VHS was an emerging technology. And given our VHS player was brand new and we didn't have very many other videos, we watched this video a number of times. But anyway, messages from the memory banks explained how we got the Bible, why there are differences in the Gospels, and made a compelling case for the trustworthiness of the New Testament. Now it did use English soccer illustrations and footage from the 1987 FA Cup, English FA Cup final to make its point, which personally I found very compelling. But the documentary showed, amongst other things, that there are overwhelmingly more manuscripts closer to the time of the events they purport to record for the New Testament than for any other ancient document. Now I'll just put this up there, hopefully you can read that at least a little bit. But that gives you a bit of a sense to show that number of copies for the ancient documents that there are and the, the approximate time span between the original and the copy. And you can see that the New Testament um, is miles in front of any other ancient document. So much so, the scholar F.F. F. Bruce writes that there is no body of ancient literature in the world which enjoys such a wealth of good textual attestation as the New Testament. He concludes, if the New Testament were a collection of secular writings, their authenticity would generally be regarded as beyond all doubt. Now, even as a fairly unreflective teenager, I found this compelling and a satisfactory reason to believe that the Bible, and particularly the New Testament, was trustworthy, that Jesus was a real historical figure, and hence I had no reason to doubt the Christian message. I believed it to be true. And then as I got to my later high school years, I became a little bit more reflective and open to spiritual things. And then in my final year of high school, in year 12, I had a profound Christian experience at a camp. And at this camp, I was also impressed by other young people my age who actually took their faith seriously. Something that I'd never really done. And that prompted me to think that maybe I should take this a bit more seriously. So I started to own the faith that I... Um, so I started to own the faith for myself. So much so that when I went to Sydney for university in 1994 to study commerce... When I was 18 years old, I actually actively sought out a church to attend. I believed that the Christian message was true and worth following, and hence it was worth finding a church as a spiritual home. Indeed, it was during my university years that my faith was solidified and strengthened. I finally understood the significance of Jesus' death for my sins as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Um, modelled on the Old Testament sacrificial system. And I enjoyed living life as a Christian believer. So much so that church became the highlight of my week. 
I grew in my faith, enjoyed reading the Bible, and threw myself into as many church and mission activities as I could. So in my late 20s, I felt it was a natural step for me to move into more towards vocational Bible ministry, and I went to theological college. Yet whilst I was convinced that the Christian message was true, when I went to Bible college, I wanted to test out this conviction, and in the process underwent the strongest and most severest test of, to my faith and challenge to my faith. Now I'd given up a potentially lucrative career uh, and successful business career by going to Bible college and I wanted to ensure that this decision was the right one. And so you know, maybe I'd made a mistake in believing Christianity to be true and Jesus to be real and I didn't want to live for a lie. So I looked for the strongest opponents of Christianity and the best arguments against the truth of the Bible. And at that time, uh, the famed scientist and atheist Richard Dawkins released his book, The God Delusion. So, I read The God Delusion around the time our eldest boy, Aidan, was born. Somewhat nervously, because if he convinced me, if there were no good reasons to believe, if messages from the memory banks had been misleading, then I should give up my faith. And I must confess, the experience was profoundly unsettling. As I read the book and felt the rhetorical force of Dawkins' arguments, my faith was radically shaken. And I seriously questioned whether God was really there. I mean, I must confess, it was disquieting to be attending lectures on the Bible and yet wondering if it was all true. Was there really any good evidence for faith? Did my prayers just worthlessly bounce off the ceiling? I was confronted afresh with the big question, is the Christian faith true? And this prompted a journey, which in some respects is still ongoing, where I read widely and thought deeply about reasons to believe. I realised how little I'd thought about some of life's biggest questions. I was the unreflective teenager no longer. Indeed, to confront the intellectual challenges of, and questions of people asked, the questions asked by Richard Dawkins and people of his ilk, a mere teenage faith would no longer suffice. And I found that as I engaged Dawkins' works, I concurred with his method. I valued evidence and reasons to believe that something is true. I agreed with Dawkins that religion should not be beyond critical examination and that a person should be able to give reasons for their faith and belief in God. Deference to simplistic reasons like just, just have faith or because my mum believes or because that's how I was brought up, just... Are clearly inadequate. Yet I came to realize that the Christian faith stands or falls on one crucial piece of information. If you want to stab Christianity in the heart, if you want to demonstrate it as false, all you need to do is demonstrate that Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead. And the Apostle Paul concurs in 1 Corinthians 15 14, where he says, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. Now, if Richard Dawkins could do this convincingly, if he could demonstrate that Christ was not raised from the dead, then I would no longer be a Christian. Now, he and many other atheist authors attempted to demonstrate how unlikely the resurrection was by proposing that the Gospels were embellished legends written many, many years after the events they purport to record by people who weren't eyewitnesses. Yet as I examined the evidence for the resurrection, I was struck by this passage that we've just had read before from 1 Corinthians 15. This passage which I consider probably the most important part of the New Testament because it provides the best evidence for the historical reality of the resurrection of Jesus and is a crucial reason for why I'm a Christian today. Because here in 1 Corinthians 15, in 3 to 5 in particular, we have what scholars have identified as an early Christian creed or a statement of belief. It's identified as a creed because of the structured parallel and repeated language we can see in verses 3 and 4. We can see here, so Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That the sort of repeated language gives an idea that this was something that the early church um, believed as a creed. But scholars also think it's a creed because in verse 3, when Paul says he passed on what he received, the word to receive is a, it's a technical word for the use of handing on tradition. 
So it appears that Paul received this creed, this body of knowledge, this pre-existing tradition, and he passed it on. Now notice that this creed contains an explicit and central reference to Jesus' resurrection. It connects Jesus' death for sins with his burial and and resurrection. He was raised on the third day and claims all of this was done in accordance with the scriptures. But most significantly and crucially, this creed was formulated very close to the event of the resurrection. Now, Paul wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians in probably about the early to mid-50s in the first century, which is at least 10 years before the final form of any of the four Gospels. But remember that Paul is passing on this creed, this Gospel message, which he'd already received. This means that this creed predates the writing of 1 Corinthians and it predates Paul himself. So this creed, this statement of belief in the resurrection of Jesus, was circulating much earlier than the 50s. In fact, it's highly likely that this creed was formulated only a couple of years or even months after Jesus' death and resurrection. So I've tried to formulate it a little bit here. So you've got the, the, the earliest gospel, which is Mark, they reckon was formulated in the 60s. 1 Corinthians was written in the 50s, but this creed was written in the 30s, which was virtually no time after Jesus' death and resurrection. So the creed can be dated very, very close to the events they report. And the time gap, historically speaking, is virtually nothing, giving no time for a legend to form or for the message to become embellished. So this section of 1 Corinthians is excellent evidence for the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead because it preserves a tradition formulated so close to the events they purport to record. It's so early. The resurrection was not an embellished legend written many years after the events. But regardless of how early the claim develops, if the claim was made by just one person, then why should we believe them? And indeed, most of our knowledge of history depends on the reports of witnesses and evaluating those reports. And this passage shows that there were numerous witnesses to the resurrection. In verse 5 to 8, Paul outlines a list of many of the different witnesses, most of whom were still alive. Cephas, or, or Peter, the 12 apostles, the 500, James, the apostles, and even Paul himself. So if any of the Corinthians doubted the historicity of Jesus' resurrection, they should go and talk with them. They'll tell you they saw Jesus alive. So the fact that so many different people saw Jesus at the same time overcomes the idea that we're just seeing ghosts or visions. Multiple people on multiple occasions were convinced they'd seen Jesus alive. And the fact that there were so many eyewitnesses to this resurrection at different times is excellent evidence, again, for the historicity of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. So this passage, this early creed embedded in this section of Paul's letter, is perhaps the earliest recorded New Testament tradition that we have. And I found it absolutely convincing. The early testimony to the resurrection, its verification by numerous eyewitnesses, and also its successful explanation for the proclamation and actions of the early church, give excellent evidence to suggest that a resurrection really happened. And I also have to say that divine activity best explains the resurrection experiences. And this is why I'm a Christian. Now I concur with Richard Dawkins' approach to evidence, but I find his selective um, reading of evidence intensely frustrating. 1 Corinthians 15 isn't even mentioned in his book, and atheists often overlook this passage when they claim that there's no evidence for God or for the resurrection. So I came through this severe test. I was convinced afresh that Jesus really had been raised from the dead. That the Christian message was true. The logic and arguments of memories, messages from the memory banks remain sound. And ironically, Richard Dawkins had strengthened my faith. It remains one of the reasons when people ask me, which books have been most influential in your life? I have to say, The God Delusion. But it also left me feeling a little bit angry because I'd almost been persuaded to leave my faith and to become an atheist for really, really bad reasons. So... I believe the Bible to be true and Jesus to be raised from the dead and these are fundamental reasons for why I'm a Christian today. Now I know that all I've said so far may sound quite intellectual and cerebral with arguments from history and the textual fidelity of the New Testament and you may wonder, has this guy ever met and experienced the risen risen Christ? So I just want to conclude today by saying that I am also a Christian because Jesus and his resurrection overcomes my biggest fear. 
And my biggest fear is the, is the fear of death. Now, the fear of death is a, is a fairly common one in our world. And comedian Jerry Seinfeld once said, according to most studies, people's number one fear is public speaking. Number two is death. So he says, no, death is number two. Does that sound right? That means that to the average person, if you go to a funeral, you're better off in the casket than doing the eulogy. Well, for me, the fear of death is actually number one. It's my number one fear. I don't have a fear of public speaking or else this new role is going to be absolute torture. <laughs> no, for me, the fear of death is a very real one. And at times I have lain awake at night worrying about that when I die, that's the end. There's nothing, not even blackness. I do at times try to envision that, that moment when I step across the abyss from life to death and it brings fear. Yet I listen to the words that Jesus speaks in John 11, 25 and 26 and it is a balm to my soul where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. I really, really want this to be true. The offer of forgiveness and eternal life through Jesus sounds wonderful. To know that even though we will succumb to death, the final enemy, yet through Jesus, death has been swallowed up in victory. Through Jesus, we will live. Now, this is why the actual physical, historical reality of the resurrection of Jesus is so important. The Apostle Paul describes Jesus' resurrection as the first fruits of our resurrection. Jesus has been raised from the dead to demonstrate that sin and death have been defeated and those who entrust themselves to Jesus will also be raised with him in glory. If Jesus wasn't physically raised from the dead, then our faith is futile and we are lost in our sins. Yet I don't believe just because I want these words to be true. A false or deluded hope is no hope or comfort at all. I believe in Jesus because I believe he's telling the truth and I trust him. And I don't believe in Jesus simply to get eternal life, as though he's simply a passport to an immortal uh, paradise. No, because I find Jesus the most captivating, generous, remarkable, beautiful, wise, generous, sacrificial and compelling person to have ever lived. Indeed, through Jesus and his resurrection and belief in him, I believe I see the world more clearly and he makes most sense of our longings and our experience of being human. I deeply resonate with author C.S. Lewis's observation who said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Jesus' resurrection changes the world for it turns the universe from a meaningless chaos and when there is no hope and ultimately despair into a designed place where there is justice and there is hope. And hence I am comforted by the historical reality of the person and resurrection of Jesus. So that whilst I do fear death, I rest in Jesus and he gives me confidence, peace and hope that death will not be the end. The song in Christ alone, has the line, no guilt in life, no fear in death. And that summarizes the good news of Jesus and why I'm a Christian. Forgiveness from our sins and freedom from our greatest enemy, death. Now there is more to say. I have many other reasons for why I'm a Christian today and I've only been able to share just a couple of reasons today. But my prayer is that in the course of time, through my ministry here at Northcote Baptist Church, I will be able to share many of the wonderful ways in which the Christian message is good, true, and beautiful. But ultimately, there is one reason for why I'm a Christian. In the end, it's all about Jesus, who was a real historical figure, who offers forgiveness through his death on the cross, and new life and hope for the future through his resurrection from the dead. Chapter 6 of the Gospel of John describes a scene where people leave Jesus because they feel that his teaching was too hard, so then Jesus confronts his disciples and asks them in John 6, 67, You do not want to leave too, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And that 
is why I'm a Christian. Let's pray. Father, we do give you thanks for the historical reality of Jesus' um, death and resurrection. And we do give you thanks that there are good reasons to believe that Jesus lived and did, was raised from the dead. We give you thanks for the resources like messages from the memory banks which have provided compelling reasons to show that the New Testament is trustworthy and reliable. And we also give you thanks that Jesus offers an uh, answer to our greatest enemy, which is death itself. And we give you thanks for his um, death on the cross for our sins to bring us forgiveness and his raising to new life to provide hope and meaning in this um, bleak and difficult world. And so we do pray that we may uh, cling to Jesus and to know him as our Lord and Saviour. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. That sounded great. So let's go from here today, empowered by the reality and presence of the risen Christ, to live and work and do all things for his glory. Amen. So let's go and, well, I don't know what happens at the end here. Do we have morning tea or something? Or do we just, have, I'm not really, not at the moment, not yet. Okay, so we can sit and, we can mingle and talk. So anyway, it's lovely to see you and look forward to meeting, uh, meeting you all. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you.